Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Keith Beattie. I'm the acting museum manager here at the Northern Ireland War Memorial Museum. And uh, you're very welcome here tonight. It's our first talk of 2024. Thank you for venturing out on yet another and Clement January evening to join us. Um, this evening, our guest speaker, Stephen Jaffa, uh, will be presenting a talk entitled A Haven from Hitler, the story of Jewish refugees who came to Northern Ireland in the 1930s and 1940s. Now, Stephen grew up as a member of the small and close-knit Jewish community in North Belfast. He's a history graduate from Cambridge University and a former lawyer. And he now lives in London, where he works as a consultant for to Israel's Red Cross affiliate. Stephen is the director of the Belfast Jewish Heritage Project and has conducted walking tours of Jewish heritage in his native city. Now, before we begin, very briefly, as always, I need to add some important information. Could you please turn off or put your phones to silent? Um, in the event of an emergency, there will be a long, continuous siren and staff will direct you to the exits, which are at the back of the room and back out through the entrance door there. So without further delay, I'd now like to welcome Stephen to tell us about a haven from Hitler. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for your interest uh, in this subject. Thank you to those who are tuning in on uh, Facebook as well. Uh, and a big thank you to the Northern Ireland War Memorial for uh, arranging this event as a Holocaust Memorial Day uh, event. It's also an opportunity for me to say thank you to a collaborator and friend of mine. His name is Bernard Enlander. We work together on the, the Belfast Jewish Heritage uh, Project. And Bernard has actually researched and written up many of the stories that I'm going to tell you uh, this evening. So a big thank you to, to Bernard. The purpose of this museum is to highlight the impact of this of war and particularly the Second World War on Northern Ireland and we think about the Blitz and we think about the Americans who came here during the Second World War, of all the people who served uh, during those wars. What I'm going to share with you this evening is also about the impact of the war on Northern Ireland. It's very much, it could come across very much as a good news story. It's about families who had the resilience and the fortitude to escape persecution from Nazi-dominated Europe, to come to a strange country, to establish themselves here, to set up businesses. And you will be quite amazed about the contribution that these families made to various parts of Northern Ireland. It's also a good news story for Northern Ireland itself, because at a time when anti-Semitism was rampant across Europe, these families were by and large welcomed and encouraged when they came to settle here. But behind that good news, there is, of course, an awful backdrop to this story. The story of the Holocaust and of the Shoah, as we say in Hebrew. I don't need to remind you, I'm sure, that during the years that I'm talking about in the 1930s and in the 1940s during the Second World War, was a period of intense persecution leading up to genocide, to the murder of six million Jews, of whom one and a half million were children, alongside other groups and peoples who the Nazis also targeted for murder. So that is the backdrop to the story that I'm going to share with you this evening. And we're going to go to Cookstown, to Five Mile Town, to Portadown, to Kilkeel, to Shrigley, to Newtonards, to Crumlin Village, to Ballymena, and to Strabane. Now that sounds like an Ulster bus timetable, uh, but each of those places had Jewish families living in them that came during uh, the war period, and they made an enormous impact in those places. I'm not even going to touch on Belfast, where there would be many other stories that I could share with you this evening, but I don't want to overload you with too many facts, uh, and we'll stick to these various uh, towns. You will also know, I'm sure, something about the Malal refugee farm in County Down, and also the kinder transport about the children who came uh, to Northern Ireland. Perhaps we can touch on that in the question and answer session. 
So a bit of background, really, a bit of context, the context of the history of the Jewish community in Northern Ireland. You're talking about three distinct waves of immigration of Jewish people who came to live in what is today Northern Ireland. That first wave was in the middle years of the 19th century, and they were uh, a small number of German Jewish linen merchants, and they were selling Irish linen across the world, and they set up their businesses here. A small number of families who left a large legacy behind. If you, I'm sure you can picture the yellow fountain at the back of the Victoria Shopping Centre that's uh, dedicated to Daniel Joseph Jaffe, the founder of the Belfast Jewish community. Yes, you heard it. His name is Jaffe. Sadly, not a relation of mine because he was a very wealthy linen merchant. <laughs> so there's the fountain, the Linen Hall Library. How many of you, when you go into the Linen Hall Library, know that that was originally the warehouse and premises of a firm called Moore and Weinberg, another uh, linen uh, house with uh, Jewish uh, ownership. Facing them were their great competitors, Jaffe Brothers, and their premises is today 10 Square Hotel. You know, if you can picture the building with all the various the busts on, on the wall there. So that was the first wave of uh, immigration of Jews uh, to uh, Northern Ireland. The second wave, well, that's people like my own family. They came from further Eastern Europe, from Poland and Lithuania. They were part of that great uh, migration of two million Jews who left Eastern Europe in the 1880s onwards. They were persecuted in Tsarist Russia. They were pogroms, particularly in, in the south of that empire. And they came across, most of them, of course, hoping to go to America. Now, why did several hundred end up here in uh, Belfast? I wish I could tell you. Uh, my family didn't end up in New York, but uh, here in Belfast, all kinds of explanations. Uh, we know that there was a cousin who came here first, and I should imagine he wrote back to the family back in Lublin in Poland and told them, that Belfast was a good place to come, it was a safe place to be Jewish, and you could make a living. And that way, various families made their way across uh, Europe, and the community uh, numbered at its height about 1,500 people. And that second wave of immigration is largely associated with North Belfast. The synagogue there uh, for many years, from 1904 to 1964, was at Ansley Street, just at the bottom of the Antrim Road at Carlisle Circus, Today, the synagogue is on the Somerton Road. And that second wave of immigration, again, made a, uh, their legacy, made their mark on the economic, cultural and social life of Northern Ireland. And of course, there is still today a functioning community uh, descended mostly from that second wave of immigration. But I'm going to talk to you this evening about a third wave of immigrants, Jewish immigrants, who came here immediately before and after uh, the Second World War as refugees from Nazi persecution. And they were quite a distinct group from the older Jewish community. They were coming mostly from Central Europe, again, from Germany, from Austria. We're going to hear from uh, Czech families, Poland and Hungary. And as I've mentioned, it's not necessarily a Belfast-centred uh, immigration. Many of these families and many of the stories are virtually unknown, even within the Jewish community that I grew up in. So for Bernard and I doing the research into these families, it was a bit of a revelation ourselves in discovering uh, the, the breadth of their uh, residents in so many different towns and villages. They were unknown to us because for many reasons, they were not necessarily integrated into that older Jewish community. It may be that their experiences of persecution in Europe made them feel that they wanted to divest themselves of their Jewish identity. Perhaps they were less religiously inclined and more culturally inclined to be Jewish. There may be various reasons, but that not all of the families became part and parcel of the Jewish community that I later grew up in. So there's another context to this immigration that I want to share with you. This will be familiar to those of you who have studied 20th century history. The 1930s in Europe, it sees the growth of fascism and Nazism. In 1933, Hitler becomes Chancellor of Germany, and immediately he uh, places restrictions on the German Jewish population. 
Immediately, he institutes a boycott of Jewish businesses. In 1935, there's the Nuremberg Laws, which classifies Jews on racial lines. It didn't matter if you worshipped on a Saturday or on a Sunday, or if you didn't worship at all. If you had Jewish grandparents, the Nazis classified you as Jews, and you were subject to persecution and restrictions. The Nuremberg Laws forbade, for example, Jews to marry non-Jews. Their rights of citizenship were stripped from them. In 1938, Nazi Germany expands. It's the year of the Anschluss, and Austria is incorporated into the Third Reich, bringing under the Nazi rule a large Jewish community, which is now faced with direct persecution for the first time. Later in 1938, as a result of the Munich Pact, Hitler is able to occupy the Sudetenland, that's Western Czechoslovakia. In 1939, he takes over the rest of Czechoslovakia. At the end of 1938, we have Kristallnacht in November, and there the world sees the violent nature of persecution against the Jews. In a single night, hundreds of synagogues are destroyed. Uh, 30,000 Jews are taken to concentration camps. They're not extermination camps at that stage, but hundreds are murdered as a result of Kristallnacht. And also the Jewish community is fined. It has to pay for the damage caused by the Nazis themselves uh, to property. So a huge economic burden is placed on the Jewish community at that time. And Jewish-owned businesses, by law, had to pass to Aryans, to non-Jewish ownership. So there's a huge amount of economic and physical pressure on the Jewish communities of Europe at this time. September 1939, Hitler invades Poland and the Second World War has begun. So why did these few immigrant families, and we're not talking about uh, many, but why did they come to Northern Ireland? Well, Northern Ireland at that time was suffering from very severe unemployment and economic depression. The linen industry had been in decline for, for many years. Shipbuilding was in decline. And even the rearmament at that time didn't uh, solve Northern Ireland's problems with a rate of unemployment at about 25%. In 1937, the Northern Ireland government passes an amended New Industries Act uh, to encourage uh, industrialists, businessmen to come to Northern Ireland to uh, set up uh, businesses, provided that they wouldn't be in competition with existing businesses. They had to prove that they could bring capital and uh, guarantees were required that they wouldn't become a burden uh, on the state. The Northern Ireland government did not have control over immigration. That was a matter for the Westminster government, uh, but it could encourage uh, businessmen and industrialists to set up in uh, Northern Ireland. Now, the category of refugees that I'm going to discuss this evening were businessmen and industrialists, but they were a small proportion of the refugees that came here. We've mentioned the, the kinder transport, the children. They were teenagers from uh, the Bachad movement, which was a, a religious Zionist movement, and they were the pioneers of the Malayal farm. There were Jewish refugees who came here and worked as agricultural laborers, as domestic servants. There were academics at Queen's University. So they were a very diverse group of people, but the families that you're going to hear about uh, this evening were industrialists and businessmen. So we're all ready to set off on this journey. I'll show you very quickly the, the, uh, the map, except it's not, uh, not moving, not budging. Was it uh, the answer? Yes, this one here. Shift. They're pausing. There we go. Okay, so this is uh, the Northern Ireland Jewish, Jewish Heritage Map. It's a project that I've mentioned. Uh, it has over 70 different Jewish stories in them uh, from all of the three uh, waves of immigration I've mentioned. So first off, so I wasn't sure which button you pressed there, Cookstown. Uh, and we're going to look at a family called the Comjat family, Morris and uh, Clara Comjat, who were textile manufacturers in Budapest up to 1939. Morris Kumjak could see what the future held. 
Hungary wasn't actually occupied by the Nazis until towards the end of the Second World War, but it had its own homegrown uh, fascist movement. There was violence against Jews. He could see what the future uh, held. And aged 40, he was brave enough to leave behind his business in Hungary. And in 1940, he's in Belfast and he set up the Dainty Fit uh, factory on College Road in Belfast. After the Blitz in May 1941, the business is moved to Cookstown, where they've taken over a former uh, garage premises. In 1944, they're employing 160 mostly female staff in Dainty Fit. In 1953, according to the local press, how they wrote in those days, 450 Ulster girls, they wrote, were sewing garments for the English Rose brand. That was the Dainty Fit brand and that they were selling to Marks and Spencers across the UK and exporting. The newspaper report spoke of uh, a new era in social conditions at the factory in uh, Cookstown. There was canteen, there was a workers club, there was transport to bring the workers to the factory. Breakfast was given to uh, younger members of staff. By 1960, 1,000 people were employed by Dainty Fit, a major, major concern for Cookstown and uh, surrounding areas. Uh, in 1961, they become a public company. In 1965, uh, eventually the family ownership is ended and they're taken over by a, an English company called uh, Northgate. So the Conchats, if they're remembered at all, well, they were involved in the chess club and the bridge club in, in Cookstown. And just think about it, the Budapest that they left behind in 1944 is occupied by the Nazis. Half a million Jews are deported from Budapest in 1944 and not 1945. Vast majority of them to Auschwitz and to Treblinka uh, where they were murdered. Uh, Mr. Komjat himself discovers that members of his own family uh, have been murdered, and that's reported in uh, the local press in, in sympathetic terms towards them. <coughs> so we're moving on to Five Mile Town, and the family there is the Pick family, Jan and Elizabeth Pick. They had a textile business in the Sedaton land. Uh, so that part of Czechoslovakia that Hitler occupied in 1938, they were able to flee to England with their two-year-old son. Jan served in the Free Czech uh, Squadron in the RAF during the Second World War, and it's business connections that bring him to Northern Ireland after the war. He visits Enniskillen to see about setting up a factory in Enniskillen. He's on the bus back to Belfast. The bus breaks down in a place called Five Mile Town. He has to spend the night in the Valley Hotel in Five Mile Town. It's still there, apparently. And the, the manager of the hotel at that time falls into conversation with Jan, says, oh, I've got a couple of rooms. Why don't you set up business here? Starts off in a very small scale with two sewing machines. They're knitting jumpers, scarves, and handkerchiefs. By the 1950s, they're employing 40 people on the Clabby Road there, with art workers uh, also uh, contributing to the firm. Uh, and they hold, the, the hold ownership of that uh, company until the 1980s, when they uh, sell to uh, the local manager, a man called Desmond Orr. Jan Pick is well known in Five Mile Town. He is the vice president of the Royal British Legion in Five Mile Town. That's Jan there, uh, and that's uh, where they're buried in Five Mile Town itself. Next stop, Portadown and the Bloch family. So very sadly, uh, George Bloch, who was a member of that family who I knew very well, perhaps you came across him yourself, he passed away this week. Uh, and he really epitomizes the story that I'm trying to uh, tell you this evening. George had a very long and very productive and fruitful life, uh, but it hang on the, on the most thinnest thread imaginable when I tell you his story. The Blochs, uh, his parents, Kasriel and Karola Bloch, 
lived in Danzig, the free city of Danzig, which is today Gdansk in Poland. And they ran various businesses and they were exporting uh, lace products to the UK uh, for Marks and Spencers. It was through a conversation that Casriel had with his chief customer in the UK that in the late 1930s, he again very bravely decided to sacrifice everything he had in Poland because he feared for his future, bearing in mind what was going on in Germany, anti-Semitism also in uh, Poland. Through assistance of the Northern Ireland government, Kasriel and his brother-in-law, Jack Shanek, set up business in Ported On. And in August 1939, they're able to bring their family across from Poland. That's Kasriel's wife, Karola, George and his brother, Richard. They leave Warsaw on the 31st of August, 1939. George writes about the journey. He says they passed sleepy towns and villages in Poland, but once they crossed the border, he could see lines and lines of German tanks, armored vehicles, artillery pieces. And when they arrived in London in early September, the headlines in the newspapers, Germany invades Poland. They were on perhaps the last train out of Warsaw. The difference between George having a long and productive life here in Northern Ireland and him being a statistic in the Holocaust was that narrow. Ulster laces in 1939 were making uniforms for the British Army. Later, they're also, and this is a common theme, selling to Marks and Spencers. 750 workers working for Ulster laces on three sites. A major, major business. They go from producing lace to various embroidery. The factory was running right till 1984. Foreign competition couldn't compete in prices in the Far East. To George's and Richard's mm -hmm. great regret, the uh, factory closed down. I'll leave the last word on the blocks to George himself. This is how he summed up his own experiences. He said, I experienced more anti-Semitism in one week in Eastern Europe than in all the years I've lived in Northern Ireland. So that's quite something uh, from, from George. So we're moving on to Kilkeel and the family there is Seculez, uh, a lady called Edith Seculez. She was a survivor. She survived not just the Nazis, but also Stalin. She was born in 1916 in Vienna. Uh, she came from quite a poor family. She loved Viennese culture. She said if she wanted to go to the opera or to the theatre, she had to skip a meal that day to save up money for the tickets. She works in a hotel there, the Hotel Bristol, one of the uh, main hotels in, in Vienna. In the Anschluss in 1938, when Hitler incorporates uh, Austria, She's aged 22. She records the facts that many of the people she regards as her friends declare support for the Nazis, and she's dismissed from her job. She goes home with the dismiss dismissal notice from her employers. She's worked in the Hotel Bristol for eight years. It says, cause of dismissal, Jew. That's the reason why she lost her job. She's seven months pregnant with her husband, uh, Kurt. They escape to Estonia, which is one of the few countries in Europe that didn't require a visa. But when uh, the Soviet Union occupies Estonia in 1940, they're enemy aliens, they're arrested, they're interned, they're then transported eastward. Uh, Edith writes about Siberia, about the course, the intense cold of the Siberian winter, but also the extreme heat of the Siberian summer. They are sent to a prison camp in Kazakhstan where they spend five years. They're actually kept there for two years after the war is finished. Kurt writes to his family, to his father who escaped from Vienna and went to a faraway place called Londonderry. And he has a factory there in Londonderry producing artificial flowers and feathers. Eventually, in 1948, they get a visa to come to Northern Ireland. They live in Derry for a while. And then, I'm not quite sure, she ends up in the other corner of Northern Ireland at Kilkeel. She might have liked the mountains, I guess, from being an Austrian. And they set up there, and she, she is the, 
the managing director of the company, which is quite unusual for a woman at that time, of the Kilkeel Knitting Mills. And they are producing uh, high-end kind of sweaters and, and knitted uh, clothing uh, for all the main stores in London. And this is what Edith says, looking back now, I can see by keeping us captive, the Russians saved our lives. They kept us from the Nazis. Often in life, she writes, from the darkest night comes the brightest dawn. So although she was in despair in that uh, prison camp in Kazakhstan, it was very far from being a holiday camp by any means. People were dying there of illness and hunger and, and work. She realized in hindsight how that had saved her lives. And if you can, if you want to know more, you can read her book, Surviving the Nazis, Exile and Siberia. She passed away in 2008, age 91. So I'll show you some photographs. That's Edith, and that's the front cover of her book. We're going to Shrigley, the village of Shrigley in County Down, very close to Kalile there, on the Strangford Loch. Shrigley was a 19th century model industrial village laid out by the Martin family linen, uh, linen merchants, and uh, they had a mill flax there, which was one of the largest spinning factories in the world. It shuts down in 1930 because of the Depression, and the villagers are left destitute as a result of that. They called themselves Hungerland. They protested. They were dependent on government handouts and charity. For 10 years, extremely high unemployment rates in Shrigley. Enter Brothers. Alfred and Jacob Utitz, who had a hundred, their family had a hundred and fifty years tradition of a, a tanning business in Czechoslovakia. They were on the lookout to increase exports. Uh, they were already living in the UK prior to the outbreak of war. They were looking at premises in the northeast of England to set up a, a factory there. The Northern Ireland government encouraged them to come over and take a look at the disused factory at Killyleigh. They thought it was much too big. It was a five-story building, much too big for what they planned until Hitler invaded the Sudetenland. They was allowed to occupy it in 1938. All of a sudden, the Utitz brothers knew they were not going back to their home and it was urgent to get their family and their friends out of there. So they took on the factory. They set up the United Krill Tanners. They were employing 90 people uh, at the uh, tannery. These were uh, formerly unemployed weavers who had to be retrained uh, in the work that they were doing. Uh, they also brought over key workers from Europe. We know one, a man called Nicholas Vermes, who was from Hungary. In 1940, he gets a letter from Kilile inviting him to take up work there. He travels across Europe in wartime, a very perilous journey. He said he didn't breathe freedom until he landed in Belfast and he came to work in the factory and they brought across other people out of uh, Nazi uh, dominated uh, Europe. By the 1960s, this company is employing 400 people. It's the first Northern Ireland company to win, to win a Queen's Award for Exports in 1966. Uh, Eric, who's a second generation member of the family, uh, becomes president of the Northern Ireland Chamber of Commerce and is awarded uh, the OBE. That's uh, the grave of the original members of the family, uh, Alfred and his uh, wife at the Jewish cemetery at Carmoney. And they run the business there until 1972, uh, when it's uh, sold again, uh, they can't compete. There's changes in fashion, leather is perhaps not such a, a popular product, and uh, the troubles also uh, does, doesn't does help. Uh, and uh, the business is taken over, I think, by a Korean company. A journalist called, called Chris Hagen, you might know him, he, he works on Ulster Television. He's written a wonderful book, Farewell to Dear Old Shrigley. He's uh, a wonderful example of a local historian who is determined that this aspect of Shrigley's history should never be forgotten. Uh, so if you want to know more about uh, what I've just told you about that particular company, Farewell to Dear Old uh, Shrigley by uh, Chris uh, Hagen. Newton Ards. A remarkable story. 
about a man called Alfred Neumann. We've coined him on the map, uh, the Ulster Schindler. No man did, uh, was able to save more lives than he did by bringing across uh, Jewish workers from uh, Europe. He left Vienna in 1936. He was in uh, England originally. In 1938, he's in Belfast and he's involved with the, there were two refugee committees in Belfast at that time to lobby and uh, help refugees come from uh, Europe uh, to, uh, to Northern Ireland. Alfred is particularly involved in bringing some of the children out who came on the kinder transport and went to live in a hostel on Clifton Park Avenue in, in North Belfast. But he also set up an enterprise in Newton Ards at Court Square. And the idea here was that he would bring out skilled uh, Jewish workers from his native Austria to train local workers on traditional handicraft skills. So they were taught kind of traditional Austrian uh, knitting, uh, manufacturing gloves, belts, handbags, winter sports equipment, the best of kind of continental uh, skills with Irish designs. That was the idea. It had the support of the, uh, the uh, Ulster Development Corporation and the Northern Ireland Ministry of Commerce. And he brought over skilled workers under the noses of Nazi bureaucrats from Vienna, from Austria to Northern Ireland. According to one of the local civil servants, he said of Alfred Norman, he had the makings of a real Ulsterman, he said. He was a man of great grit and determination in what he was trying to do. Norman spoke very movingly about the daily barbarism that his co-religionists were experiencing in Austria at the time. For him, it was a humanitarian gesture to get as many out as possible. For many in the Northern Ireland government, it was of course an economic issue to try and encourage businessmen and uh, to create work. He was also involved in a business in, in Londonderry called Gilfillan and Neumann that was based in the uh, in the docks area of uh, Derry. And again, it was bringing across refugees uh, to Northern Ireland. And that factory that he set up in, in Newton, Newton Ards actually continued under a different name uh, of Le Winter. And that they, they were a couple, uh, Zoltan and Annie Le Winter, who came from Vienna Zoltan was one of the greatest patrons of the arts in Northern Ireland. There's a blue plaque to that couple on the Malone Road, and he uh, is very well remembered in the art world. Uh, he sponsored, assisted, helped many local uh, artists uh, here. And the name Le Winter is kept alive in Newton Ards. If, I don't know if you know it, but there's a restaurant there called Le, Le Winters. But what happened to Alfred Neumann is a very tragic story. He went back to England. He was uh, interned in December 1939. Uh, the British government was very concerned about invasion. There, there were many Germans in, uh, in the UK and Winston Churchill said, colour the lot of them. He said, we haven't got time to work out who are the Nazis, who are the refugees, intern the lot. Uh, Neumann was sent to the Isle of Man, he was interned and uh, they were going to ship them overseas. He was on a ship called the Arendora Star to take, uh, to take them to Canada. Uh, it was sunk off the uh, northwest coast of Ireland uh, by a U-boat of 1,600 passengers on board. Uh, 800 were drowned, and sadly, Alfred Neumann uh, was one of them. So a very sad ending. Crumlin Village. I'll sorry, show you the photographs. That's uh, Neumann with uh, civil servants and some of the staff, some of the people he brought out of Austria uh, in 1939 in Newton Ards. That's his internment card. And that's the Arendora Star, which uh, he went down on. Crumlin Village, County Antrim. Zdena Wolf is a Holocaust survivor. She was born Zdenka Gluck in the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1898. 
1942, she's deported by the Nazis from Prague to the Theresienstadt ghetto, which we can still visit today. It's north of Prague. 150,000 Jews ended up there. 15,000 of them were children. It's very cynically called a model camp because the Nazis used Theresienstadt. They took the International Red Cross there. They showed uh, an, a Jewish orchestra playing in Theresienstadt. They purported to show a viable Jewish life there. The truth was uh, that the Jews were deported on from Theresienstadt uh, to Auschwitz, uh, to Treblinka, to their deaths. And over 30, 33,000 Jewish people died in Theresienstadt itself. It wasn't an extermination camp, but they died of starvation, of overwork, and of uh, uh, disease. Zdenka survives that. After the war, she re-establishes a business in Czechoslovakia, but she finds it very difficult at the time of the communist takeover. Uh, she has a family connection to Northern Ireland. That's the Kafka family. They're involved with a factory in Suffolk House in South Belfast called Ulster Pearls, and they arrange for her to come to Northern Ireland. And she sets up a biz business herself in Crumlin Village. It's called County Ware Limited. She lives at the Manse in Cross Hill. Her business is on, on the main street in Crumlin Village. Later, uh, she reverts to the wholesale jewellery business. She's uh, living in Belfast with her business premises in Royal Avenue. She retires to London in 1976, died in the age of 101. And uh, her grave, which I've seen in the Jewish cemetery at Bushy, describes her very simply as a survivor of the Holocaust. That's uh, the record of her, uh, her, her imprisonment in Theresienstadt. And that's the grave that I've just mentioned. Crivilli Valley near Balamina, I've just got a couple of more locations. Uh, a man called Henry Nathan, who was born in Bromberg, Germany in 1898. He was managing director of a company in Germany that manufactured furniture, uh, furnishing fabrics. The company transferred him out of Germany in 1937 out of concern for his safety, uh, obviously at a time of, of intensifying Nazi persecution. He spends the war year serving, war years serving in the Royal Pioneer Corps, which is the only unit open to him as an enemy alien. In 1947, he has the benefit of a government grant to set up a company called Tapestry Weavers Ulster Limited in uh, Crivilli Valley near Balamina. They're producing carpets, upholstery and tapestry. It combined local weaving skills with continental expertise. He brings across uh, some craftsmen from Europe. And it all began in a former RAF storage unit uh, with one loom and half a dozen workers. And they're producing very high-level, high-end reproductions of French and Italian tapestry, which was sold to embassies and palaces and ocean-going liners. So this is very high-end stuff. Uh, in the coronation year, Queen Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh visit the factory and they are presented with cushion uh, covers and they're employing about 70 people. And you can see them, the recruitment advertising. So uh, the, the firm lasted until the 1950s. It failed because, uh, again, uh, competition. So not a one of the kind of more longer lasting uh, businesses. I'm going to end up in Straban. Uh, another remarkable story, a man called Rolf Nosquith. This is Rolf. Rolf was from a Polish Jewish family that had moved to Germany and they had a hosiery factory in uh, Eastern Germany. Uh, again, this is a family that could see what was coming, and they left Germany in the late 1930s 
and they uh, transfer their business. They set up in Derbyshire, and it's a growing business. In 1960, Rolf takes advantage of uh, government loans and grants to set up a factory in Straban, uh, where he could put the insert the latest machinery for a textile factory. And this is the Adria Company, which employed at one stage one in four of the workforce in Straban. So another major, major uh, company. But Rolf had another claim to fame, which he never really spoke about. Probably uh, a very great day in the British war effort was when Rolf failed his medical to get into the British Army. Because he had other talents, he was a problem solver, a great mathematician. He was a native German speaker. He loved crossword puzzles. So it was British intelligence who took him on. He ended up as part of the Bletchley Park operations. And as a very young man in his 20s, he was one of the youngest code breakers. But he managed to break the German naval code. This enabled the British to to uh, intercept and understand the coded uh, signals and messages between German ships and U-boats and uh, their HQs back in Germany. He made a major, major contribution in the Battle of the Atlantic. So I've shared with you lots of stories there, lots of families, many of them were unknown to me until we did the research uh, and Bernard did the research. I haven't gone into various factories in Belfast. I'll just mention them, some of them by name, the Belfast Silk and Rayon Factory, which was on Waterford Street off the Falls Road. That was the Soccer family, a Jewish family from Czechoslovakia, silk screen painting. I've mentioned Ulster Pearls that was in Dunmurray. That was the Kafka family and the Herman family. Uh, there was Bellart. Does anybody remember the firm Bellart? That was the Koner family. Franz Kohner and his wife Edith were administrators on the Malal farm. They came from Czechoslovakia. They ran the farm, the administration of it, and they stayed in Northern Ireland after the war. Uh, he called his factory Bellart. One of his customers one day said that Belfast was, as far as he was concerned, was uh, associated with shoddy goods. And Franz took massive exception to this. That's why he called it Bellart, Belfast, and he incorporated the Belfast coat of arms in uh, his uh, branding of his products with permission of Belfast City Council. Mm -hmm. So there you go, remarkable stories, remarkable families, uh, contribution made by a small group of families uh, bringing employment to much needed uh, to Northern Ireland at the time, contributing also to the cultural and social life and the diversity of this part of the world. So I would be delighted to take your questions, any comments you have, perhaps some memories that you have about some of these uh, families, factories, or indeed about uh, the other waves of Jewish immigration that I've mentioned. I'm very happy to do my best to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Stephen, for what you shared. Um, it's so obvious that the Jewish people have made such a major contribution to our life here and our history in Northern Ireland. I just feel very moved to um, listen to the stories of the people who contributed so much. And I wonder, uh, I'm thinking about our young people who are growing up here in Northern Ireland. I don't know what it's taught in school, but I just feel that this is something that our young people need to know. And I don't know if the, the Jewish history of Northern Ireland is incorporated at all into the education system here in the schools. I feel it's absolutely crucial that our young people know about that aspect of our history. So I... I uh... Sadly, the Jewish community is, is declining in Northern Ireland. Uh, you're talking about membership of the synagogue of between 60 and 70 people. Uh, the census showed up about 430 Jews, people identifying as Jews in the Northern Ireland census. 
So there would be, I would say, you know, entire cohorts of young people who've never met Jewish people, don't have Jewish children. I mean, it's also quite an aging community, mostly retired people. So I agree with you entirely that uh, they've never met Jews. They're probably not aware of, of the history of uh, and the contribution. It's certainly something that uh, that the Northern Ireland Jewish Heritage Project is hoping to uh, enhance and increase uh, what we do. We do uh, walking tours in the centre of Belfast. Uh, it, it normally brings an older clientele. So we need to think about how to reach that uh, younger generation. And I think there would be lots of people who'd want to partner with us in terms of schools uh, and communities, uh, because I think, you know, in, in an age of surging racism and anti-Semitism, it is very important that this story is uh, is got out there and people people are aware of it. So thank you very much for, for that comment. Can I ask? Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah I'm just wondering, is there ever any local resistance to refugees coming over here? And if so, how that might have encountered? Okay, so, you know, a, a, an excellent question. Uh, I am not aware, I mean, Northern Ireland didn't have a kind of a very large kind of fascist movement. You had the Black Shirts and Oswald, Oswald Mosley in uh, in England. You had something called the Blue Shirts in what was then the Irish Free State. I'm not aware of, of a very large uh, comparable uh, situation here. I have come across some negative response to the Malal farm from other farmers, maybe around and about, who felt it was unfair to have a subsidised farm uh, in their locality. Uh, but I do believe that that was short lived, uh, and that uh, once the Jewish community, the Jews, Jewish refugees in Malal integrated more, and, and some of the children there went to Malal village school, and I've spoken to some of the of the generation who would remember that them coming, that that kind of uh, prejudice uh, dissipated. You can imagine it must have been very strange in the village of Malal to hear so much German spoken and people with German accents that I'm pretty sure that, yes, there must have been uh, initial uh, suspicion. Uh, but overall, as we heard from George Bloch, you know, his, his uh, comment there that he'd experienced more anti-Semitism in a week in Europe, he went to school in Danzig where the population would have been uh, German, uh, and he felt the raw end, raw edge of, of persecution there. Coming to Northern Ireland was for him a breath of freedom. And uh, so I'm sure more research would amplify uh, my response, but my initial thought on it is, is remarkably uh, little. Mm -hmm. yeah. Stephen, you've talked about the Malaya farm, and we often hold it up as a great thinking of, you know, this is great what Northern Ireland did to save these children of refugees, and it is. But do you think sometimes if we overemphasize that too much, we could have done a lot more? We can see in order. Well, I think, you know, the, the scale of the refugee crisis in the 1930s uh, was huge. I mentioned Kristallnacht, and I think at that point, the world couldn't hide from the, the violence of it, that it wasn't uh, purely legal discrimination. It was about the lives, safeguarding the lives. I would recommend to everyone to go and see a film which is uh, on release at the moment, One Life, which tells the story of how a small group of people, Nicholas Winton being one of them, but uh, amongst another small group of people, made a massive difference in bringing out hundreds of children out of Prague and Czechoslovakia. They extended the kinder transport, which was the UK government's offer to bring 10,000 children from Nazi-occupied Europe to Britain, but without their, fa their families. And that was an example of how a small group of people could make a huge difference. So when you look at what I started by telling you the backdrop of six million dead and one and a half million children, what could it possibly have been enough? What could have been adequate? The Jewish community here itself uh, did a lot. They uh, provided guarantees. You had to give a, a guarantee for every refugee so that they wouldn't be. Uh, a burden on the on the state, a man called Barney Horwitz, who was one of the lay leaders of the community, a guy called Morris Solomon, who you might know from a firm called Solomon and Perez. These are all businessmen. They all did a lot, but gosh, shouldn't we all have done more in, in not just in hindsight, because I think the writing, the writing was on the wall. And I think that is a great message for our 
time and our generation as well. Yeah. Um, from what I understand, the thing with the Jewish people who were coming in at that time, Israel, uh, Britain was in charge of Israel. And uh, I'm told about uh, dog loads of Jewish people coming to escape from Europe and being turned back to Europe from the what they think is faithful. And I really think that was an awful thing for Britain to do because all the people are saying, as I understand it, point. So yes, the, the, the British passed a white paper restricting Jewish immigration to what was then British Mandate of Palestine and I think the year 1938 and the Navy patrolled the coast and uh, what they described as illegal ships uh, bringing refugees across uh, were turned back. Uh, after the war, many were interned in places like Cyprus and uh, Mauritius. So yes, it, it's a hard story of uh, this country's involvement, indeed. And I think it was probably brought down um, when I was 11, and um, I heard, as well as the blog, who was a name I knew well, my father actually talked to several of them. Um, the name of Shannon was one I haven't heard of for a very long time, but they were our next door neighbors. Okay, wow, well, so John Shannon was the brother-in-law of Kasriel Bloch. Yeah, so I think George and Richard went to Portadown College, and they were remembered as as he was, George, who's passed away this week. They exuded a sort of Central European charm. They were very considerate people. They were always interested in in, in other people's stories. This is my experience of, of George. Uh, you know, wonderful, wonderful ambassadors, really, wonderful contribution that they made to Portadown, as you say, very well known in that time. Yeah, so an end of an era with the passing of George. There's a son, Michael, who's Richard's son. Michael is a very well-known historian and writer. He's written a lot of books about uh, Edward uh, VIII and uh, Mrs. Simpson. So uh, a very well-known author. He also went to Portadown College, I believe. Okay, indeed. Quite a character, I believe. So can I just ask... If, is it, was that new to you? Did many of you know the breadth of it or the? Well, but most Jewish um, businessmen have been around to many Belfast and um, really not much far out of there. Um, I was associated with Jewish people who like the Ferringer, the jailers. Uh, that, of course, got them off to Holland and Wolf, I think, had been tried. Just stuff Wolf from Holland and Wolf, yeah. You know, into the smaller villages like True, as I've said, it was a revelation to us as well. Many of the families, as I've said, were not kind of integrated into the Jewish community. Uh, there were cultural reasons for that. My uh, forebears came from Eastern Europe. It was a very Eastern European Jewish community. These were Central European uh, Jewish people, often very cultured in terms of, of European culture. So also they might have been uh, less orthodox in their uh, Jewish faith. They, they may not have had faith. So uh, they didn't integrate easily into the community. The Jewish community itself in Belfast was perhaps a little bit inward looking. So for all these reasons, this was a new history to me. And uh, as uh, we've pointed out, Five Mile Town, uh, Cookstown or whatever, uh, yes. Coming from a uh, did from County Tyrone and having worked in my early years, and I was just before in Tyrone for Nana, I was vaguely aware of, of Adria and um, St. Ethan, and even the Five Mile Town. But probably even some local song, now nobody ever said that was started by Jews. You know, I think people were vaguely aware of somebody that comes from the continent to start it, but the Jewish. Thing and, and the refugee the aspect. Things are totally died out, you know. Mm -hmm. Probably because you see the people. Mm -hmm. had integrated totally into the community, you know, and the, the Jewish aspect seemed to have dissipate. For many of them, of course, being Jew background. if you came from a secular Jewish family living in Central Europe, being Jewish only meant being trouble only meant trouble. It only meant yeah. uh, being singled out for persecution. <laughs> In the, in the, yes, indeed. And, and perhaps they, they preferred it that way, that they could. For some of them, I think so. They, they wanted to, to blend in and, and leave that aspect behind. Not all of them. The Bloch family was 
very involved in in the in the Jewish community. So there are different levels of of identification and commitment. But I do feel if you've been through that level of persecution, you can understand why you might want to make when you're making a new life for yourself to try and push it back. And, and many of the children of parents who've uh, experienced that say that their parents very often didn't want to share their stories that they you know they didn't want to pass that on to their to their children i mean another example of a of a refugee who came here of course is helen lewis uh, the dancer there's going to be an event tomorrow at the linen hall library uh, discussing her contribution to northern ireland which of course was through dance uh, and she's an example of the cultural input i've talked a lot about uh industrialists and business people, but she came here really, uh, the impact she made on generations of school children here teaching them dance and very much a pioneer of modern dance uh, in Belfast. So that's a different aspect to uh, the, the Jewish refugee story at this time. Yeah, so they're, they're available on Amazon, Terry. So uh, the Edith Seculi's book, Survival of Surviving Stalin uh, and the Nazis, uh, that's still available. Another book that is not well known, which I would really recommend, is by a woman called Peggy Lowenthal, From Belfast to Belson. Peggy actually was the granddaughter of one of the first wave of Jewish settlements in Northern Ireland, one of those early German linen factories, linen merchants that came here. Uh, her father worked for that firm, Moore & Weinberg, that uh, the premises are now the Linen Hall Library. Uh, she grew up here in Belfast. Uh, after the war, she's one of the first people into the liberated Belsen camp. And she uh, devotes the rest of her life, really, mm -hmm. to uh, the welfare of uh, Jewish survivors, displaced people, uh, and again, later on, Jews who were able to escape uh, communist Eastern Europe. So that's another book that's out there, Peggy Lowenthal, uh, called From Belfast to Belson. I'm sure I'm, I drive through Trigley all the time. Trigley, yeah. I've never had any of the but... The tannery there, uh, the yeah. United Chrome Tannery. So one of the, the people there, local person, said that the, what the Utitz family did was a godsend to the village. You remember the, the extent of unemployment, of uh, you know deprivation there in the 1930s. He talked about a time when there were six buses coming from Don Patrick alone, bringing uh, workers to the tannery. So uh, yes, a big turnaround in, in the history of, of Shrigley village. And there's a film about Nicholas Burbage's life that I have access to. Oh, I'd love to see that. Yeah. Okay, so I mentioned Nicholas, he came with the was that the Bloch family? No, the yeah, Tannery, the Tannery yes, family. Yeah. Utits, yes. The, the brain, his descendants still live in the country. But... Fabulous. No, I'd love to know more about that. Yeah. Grant at the back there. Excuse me. Um, I was about 15 CDs at home. Uh, the first one from the New Island. There's about 100 photographs on them. Um, all the British officers and the British officers. Yeah. And the British officers 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 and if anybody wants to make a contribution to your work, I suggest about five kinds of things for CV. But any topics you think you use. Thank you, Grant. That's very, very kind. And it's important to keep a photographic record of, of Malal. Uh, we don't know about the, they're privately owned those buildings, so we, we don't uh, know about their long term future. Yes, so that's a very important photographic record that you've taken. So thank you for that, Grant. Thank you. Do you think that the Jewish names, you know, how they became more anglicised or localised? Do you think that there'd be more people of the Jewish blood as it were in, in this country that, you know, they don't identify themselves as good? Oh, definitely. Absolutely. With, with Jewish grandparents and uh, great-grandparents. And it's, a, you know, as people get more interested in family history, and some of them do DNA searches. I get lots of people writing to me saying, oh, I'm 25% Ashkenazi Jewish. How, how could that be? And uh, you ask them the name of their, their grandparents or great-grandparents, and sometimes it's possible to identify how they are fitted into the community of maybe a century ago. But you're right, there are many, many people who would have uh, some uh, Jewish uh, ancestry and perhaps not even aware of it. 
Quite possibly, yeah, indeed. <clears throat> um, in Northern Ireland, when these uh, Jewish families, uh, Jewish people are uh, settled, uh, it was a very divided uh, experience, I don't know. But uh, what is your um, approach? How they found themselves in this uh, divided society? Were they closer to the Catholic or the Protestant community? Or so were they, were they Protestant Jews or Catholic Jews? <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> So I, I would say that they they would have had a, a deep suspicion of sectarianism because of their own experiences. I, I can't speak for all of them and not all of them have left kind of records that I can you know say what they thought about anything. Uh, but my hunch would be that they were they would have seen themselves and I think this is certainly true of the the Utitz family in in Killy Lay, as part of modernizing Northern Ireland as they would have seen it. Uh, they were bringing in latest uh, factories and, and bring, trying to modernize. And I think sectarianism to them would have been something that they would have hoped to have overcome. It'd be interesting to see what the sectarian makeup of the workforce in, in these various places were. It's, it's a very good question. I can't give you a, uh, you know, a considered answer from source material. Uh, but my hunch would be that they would have regarded sectarianism as being something that would have reminded them of uh, their own uh, experiences. That's just my uh, take on it. But certainly there's room for a lot more research. There has been academic research done. Uh, and that is, I'm sure, one of the questions that uh, would need to be looked at. Stephen, most of the Jewish people went to the Protestant schools, the I went to Belfast Royal Academy, which was quite a slightly mixed, I would say, at that at that time, and has, has become more mixed. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Uh, that's the, a different wave of Jewish immigration. Don't forget, Belfast Royal Academy is right bang in the middle of the area where Jewish people settled. Uh, the Jaffe School was just a little bit further down the Cliftonville Road, and that was set up by Sir Otto Jaffe. He stipulated that it was to be for Protestants and Catholics as pupils on the management committee and on the teaching staff. So it was fairly unique because he did that in the very early 20th century. But Belfast Royal Academy was situated right bang in the middle of the area of Jewish settlement. Thank you. I have to that. A lot of Jewish so I think education was always seen by the immigrant generation has been the way that their children could improve themselves. So there was always a great stress. There is always the, the joke about the, the Jewish mother who, who wants to have the doctor as, as the son, my son, the doctor. Uh, the thing about having a son who's a doctor is that you can practice medicine anywhere in the world. And so the phrase was gain a doctor, but lose a son. And uh, on the map here, we have a, uh, a whole story about well over a hundred Belfast Jewish doctors. It could have staffed a medium-sized hospital, uh, and uh, but many of them practiced uh, across the world in North America, in England. Some went to Israel, etc. So, uh, yes, it was a, a a big focus in education. I do want to make the point again. I was uh, focusing on a small group of refugees who were businessmen, but we can also look at Jewish refugees who came here and worked as agricultural laborers and as domestic servants. So socially, they came from different backgrounds, different opportunities. Uh, some of them were, didn't have the ability to go to school. They had to leave uh, to go into the family business at a, at a young age. So there's a range, a whole range of experiences uh, within even a, a small group of people. Thank you for so many questions. I really appreciate it coming up from all different uh, angles. I uh, really appreciate your engagement and your interest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen.